Good morning, everyone. I am so happy you're here. You might not be in a few minutes, though, unless you really like scary stories. They're not my favorite. Today's story was kind of hard for me to learn about when I was little, but it shows God's power and it shows God's protection of his people. And so if you'll stay with me, I promise it won't get too scary. Well, let's pick up where we left off last week in the story. Remember Moses? Well, this is even crazier than a burning bush that didn't burn. In Exodus 4, 27, God told um, Aaron to go and meet his brother, who he hadn't seen in a long time, remember? Moses in the wilderness. Well, Moses told Aaron all that had happened. He told him everything that God wanted Aaron to say to the Israelites and to Pharaoh. They gathered all the elders, the uh, oh, maybe the leaders and the Israelite people together, and Aaron spoke all the words, and Moses did all the signs that God showed them. Well, the people believed. Remember, Moses had been worried that nobody would listen to him. Well, in chapter 5, we learn about Moses and Aaron's trip to speak to Pharaoh for the first time. They boldly spoke, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go. You know, you don't have to be scared or shy when you're doing exactly what God says. Well, Pharaoh was not impressed. He made a huge mistake and said, Who is this Lord that I should obey his voice? I will not let them go. Not a good idea. Remember, the Israelites, though, did all the work for him. They were building all the buildings, making bricks. They were doing everything in Egypt. And Pharaoh didn't pay them. He had them work as slaves. These are the people they had kind of invited in during the famine to start uh, living there and to uh, have the food they needed. He really was not going to let them go. Well, Moses and Aaron tried again and asked if they could just leave for three days to go make a sacrifice to God in the wilderness. I think that would be reasonable. I mean, a three-day vacation, right? Pharaoh just told them to get back to work. But when Moses and Aaron left, Pharaoh showed his anger that they had bothered him uh, so much. And he told his officials to make the Israelites work even harder. They had to do more work and they were treated even worse. And it had been very bad before. At the end of chapter five, we are told that the Israelites were in such bad shape that they got mad at Moses and Aaron because things had become even worse than they had before. It wasn't fair, and they started wondering if Moses and Aaron had told them the truth. Their faith was just not quite strong enough. God knew everything that was going to happen, but Pharaoh was in for a surprise. Actually, ten surprises. Well, God spoke to Moses again and reminded him of his promise. I bet he was a little discouraged, too, that Pharaoh just didn't listen. He heard the cries, and God had heard the cries of his people, and he was going to deliver the people from slavery and into the promised land. He sent Moses and Aaron back to Pharaoh. He told them what Pharaoh, though, was going to say before he even said it. Pharaoh told them to do some kind of miracle to prove themselves. Well, Aaron took his staff, remember that hooked um, stick that a shepherd choose, and he threw it down. And just like Moses, when he had done it in the, uh, in the wilderness, it turned into a serpent. Well, Pharaoh called in his magicians, and they did the same trick. And so Pharaoh thought, hmm, I, I got this. But Aaron's snake ate all the other snakes up to show a sign of strength. But Pharaoh still wouldn't listen. I think that would get my attention. Well, God told Moses and Aaron that the first of the 10 plagues was about to happen. Remember I said there were 10 surprises coming. They called Pharaoh to meet them by the Nile River the next morning. And while he was watching, Moses and Aaron put the staff across the water and it turned into blood. Gross. Even water that they had collected out of the river and stored in jars by their homes turned to blood. 
This was horrible for the Egyptians. This was the water they drank, they cooked with, they washed with, they bathed in. All of the fish died and the river stank. Seven days passed. Pharaoh though, had his magicians do the same trick and turn water into blood on the smaller scale and they cut. So Pharaoh just decided not to believe them, but God knew this was gonna happen. God told Moses to go ask again. They commanded, let my people go. He refused, even though Moses and Aaron told him that the second plague was coming. They warned him, frogs were coming. God promised that the Nile River would swarm up with frogs. They would come out of the water and just cover the land. So Aaron stretched his arm over the Nile again and the frogs did. They came up from the river and they covered the land. Gross. Frogs are cute when it's just one, right? Not when there are thousands and thousands all around you. Well, many of the Egyptians believed in a god of frogs. It's crazy, right? But the one true God knew how to get their attention and to prove that god of frogs was ridiculous. Every one of the things that happened is tied to a God that the Egyptians worshiped. And God is with a little G. That means he's not our God. They were just things that were made up. Well, this was awful. Pharaoh finally couldn't take it anymore and begged Moses to make it stop. He agreed to let the people go. Finally. So the next day, Moses and Aaron prayed and all the frogs died. That wasn't really the end of it. I mean, they had a bunch of dead frogs laying around. They gathered them up and they put them in piles all over the land. They started to smell again. But Pharaoh did not tell the truth. As soon as those frogs were out of the way, he changed his mind and he said they could not leave. Lying to God, not smart. Well, Aaron outstretched his arm a third time and gnats came out of the dust and filled the air. Ooh. The magicians could not make the same trick exactly happen this time. Have you ever been outside and a swarm of mosquitoes or bugs flying around, usually kind of at night? Oh, I can't even imagine. Well, Moses went back to Pharaoh again. This time he warned of the fourth plague, flies. That would probably be kind of similar, right? Um, but no flies were in the area where the Israelites were living. In fact, they were protected from all of these plagues. They had an area where they lived away from the Egyptians and they would just come to work and none of their area was ever bothered by all of these plagues. Well, swarms and swarms of them surrounded the Egyptians. Gross. Well, Pharaoh was not learning his lesson and his people were the ones that were hurt. Pharaoh again told Moses to plead for him and that he would let the Israelites go. Do you believe them? Me either. Well, God took away the flies, but Pharaoh changed his mind again. Seriously? They continued, this continued back and forth for several more plagues. The fifth plague was the Egyptian animals. Many of them were killed by the disease, not, uh, but not the Israelites' animals. Only the Egyptians' animals had a disease and died. The sixth one was horrible. It was pain, these painful and gross sores covered them. They're called boils, covered the Egyptians and their animals. Even the magicians were covered. So that doesn't look good for the magicians, right? If they can't even protect themselves, it was kind of hard for them to do any more tricks right then. The seventh plague was hail. Have you ever been in a hailstorm or seen hail fall in a thunderstorm? These were giant balls of ice falling from the sky. They ended up killing some people, animals, but it also killed some of their plants, their food that they were growing. Awful. You'd think somebody would notice. Well, the eighth plague was another swarm. This time it was locusts. And these are like flying grasshoppers 
but they're much different than grasshoppers. They kind of eat everything in sight, and that's exactly what they did. They destroyed everything that was left in the crops, anything that was still growing after the hail or the bugs had gotten to them that were there before. Well, the ninth plague was darkness. This time, it was completely dark for three days. None of the Egyptians could move around at all. They couldn't see anything. Pharaoh tried to trick Moses again and say they could go, but as long as they left their animals behind. But that's not what God had said. When we obey, we obey completely and immediately. And so God, uh, Moses knew that that was not what God wanted him to do. Well, Pharaoh sent them away and told them he never wanted to see them again. Well, God had the worst plague still to go. You'd think this was so horrible already, all the, that the Egyptian people had to go through. But remember, they had been tormenting the Israelites for years and years and years. They were not treating them well at all, and they were uh, taking their labor to, to get rich, and then they were hurting the Israelites. So don't feel too bad for them. Well, Pharaoh caused his people to go through all of this because he refused to listen to God's demands. God told the Israelites to do something that they did to sacrifice a lamb in order to ask for forgiveness for sins, but this time he told them to do something different. Okay, they, were, um, they had a big meal, and they were to take the lamb and the blood from the lamb, and they were supposed to paint it kind of on their doorpost, and that's very odd, right? This was uh, brand new to them, but they did just what God said. Only the Israelites knew to do this, though. Not the Egyptians. None of them put blood over their doorposts of the lamb. Only the Israelites. We call this the Passover because that night, God passed over the Israelites' houses that had the, uh, the sacrificial lamb blood on their door, and, they didn't, and he didn't hurt anybody in those homes. But God hurt the Egyptian families instead including Pharaoh's family. He even heard some of the animals owned by the Egyptians. This time they were crying out in pain. They were hurt. Remember the Israelites had been crying out to God for a long, long time. But the Egyptians were devastated. Pharaoh had finally had enough, finally. And he called for Moses and Aaron to come back and told them just to leave just to go and take their people. Well, Moses had told the Israelites to be packed and ready to go. They didn't even have time to bake their bread. They just grabbed their dough and took it with them so they could bake it when they got away from Pharaoh. So that's exactly what they did. They left super fast. The Israelites were allowed by God to take gold and treasures from the Egyptians and just leave. Do you think Pharaoh finally learned his lesson? I mean, a lot of bad stuff happened. Surely he did after God showed his amazing power, right? That many times? Well, the Bible tells us over 600,000 men were in the group of Israelites. This was not a small group traveling. Then there were women and children to go with that. They just didn't tell us the count in the Bible. There, this would have been very hard to move such a huge group of people. But God was with them. This is true for us too. We might not have to move away from Pharaoh or be in, tied in slavery, but God is with each and every one of us every single moment. The Israelites might have stopped believing because they had such a hard life and, and had to wait so long, but they didn't. Our faith cannot be based only on God answering our prayers the way we want him to and the second that we ask. That's not how God works. He knows best and he loves us so much that he wants the best for each of us. In fact, he loves us more than we can imagine.